Hi, I'm Jim Morgan. I'm with the Corporate Relations Department of the New York Times, and I'm here to take you on a tour of the New York Times. So, let's begin. So, they're just taking audio uh, in here. Yeah, they're taking audio in here. Audio. No cameras, no still. We went over this quite thoroughly. They don't even take a still camera in here. So we're in the composing room. This is where the pages are composed. This is the typographical area. What's the ratio of um, news to advertising? 60% ads. Um, this might seem uh, uh, big, but uh, it, it is average, in fact, below average. Our 60% might include, on some days, maybe uh, 20 pages of classified advertising all to itself, where the rest of the newspapers weighted much heavier news to advertising. But the paper in its entirety, every day, large or small, is 60 ads, 40 news. Well, that uh, completes our tour of the New York Times, and I hope you found it uh, informative, and uh, I hope uh, that you uh, read the New York Times uh, every day of your life from now on. The major agenda-setting media, after all, what are they? As institutions in the society, what are they? Well, in the first place, they are major corporations, in fact, huge corporations. Uh, furthermore, they're integrated with and sometimes owned by even larger corporations, conglomerates, so, for example, by Westinghouse and GE and so on. What I wanted to know was how specifically the elites control the media. What I mean is, it's I guess... It's like asking, how do the elites control General Motors? Well, why isn't that a question? I mean, General Motors is an institution of the elites. They don't have to control it. They own it. You know? Except, I guess, at a certain level, I think... Um, like, I, I, I guess I work with student press, and, I, and I, so I know, like, reporters and stuff. The, and the elites don't control the student press, but I'll tell you something. You try in the student press to do anything that breaks out of conventions, and you're going to have the whole business community around here down on your neck, and the, in, the university's going to get threatened, and, you know... I mean, maybe nobody will pay any attention to you. That's possible. But if you get to the point where they don't stop paying attention to you, the pressures will start coming. Because there are people with power. There are people who own the country, and they're not going to let the country get out of control. So what we have in first place is major corporations, which are parts of even bigger conglomerates. Now, like any other corporation, they, they have a product which they sell to a market. Uh, the market is advertisers, that is, other businesses. What keeps the media functioning is not the audience. They make money from their advertisers. And remember, we're talking about the elite media, so they're trying to sell uh, a good product, a product which raises advertising rates. And ask your friends in the advertising industry, that means that they want to mo adjust their audience to the more elite and affluent audience that raises advertising rates. So what you have is institutions, corporations, big corporations, that are selling relatively privileged audiences to other businesses. Well, what point of view would you expect to come out of this? I mean, without any further assumptions, what you'd predict is that what comes out is a picture of the world, a perception of the world, that satisfies the needs and the interests and the perceptions uh, of the sellers, the buyers, and the product. Now, there are many other factors that press in the same direction. If people try to enter the system who don't have that point of view, they're likely to be excluded somewhere along the way. After all, no institution is going to happily design a mechanism to self-destruct. It's not the way institutions function. So they all work to exclude or marginalize or eliminate dissenting voices or alternative perspectives and so on because they're dysfunctional. They're dysfunctional to the institution itself. Twelve million pounds of confetti dropped into New York City's so-called Canyon of Heroes. Americans were officially welcoming the troops home from the Persian Gulf War. So it worked out really great for us. I mean, uh, it just goes to show that we're a mighty nation and uh, we'll be there or no matter what comes along, I mean, it's the strongest country in the world, and you got to be glad to live here. So tell me what you feel about uh, media coverage of the war. I guess it was good. It got to be a mu bit much after a while, but uh, I guess it was good to know everything, you know. Because in Vietnam, you didn't really know a lot was going on, but here you pretty much are up to the 
for the moment on everything, so I guess it was good to be informed. From a place called East Timor. Uh, I can't say that I have. Where? <laughs> East Timor? Nope. No, huh? Be on the model and how would one go about doing that? Well, there are a number of ways to proceed. Uh, uh, one obvious way is to try to find more or less paired examples. Uh, history doesn't offer true controlled experiments, but it often comes pretty close. Uh, so one can find uh, uh, atrocities or abuses of one sort that on the one hand are committed by official enemies and on the other hand are committed by uh, friends and allies or by the favored state itself, by the United States in the U.S. case. And the question is whether the media accept the government framework or whether they use the same agenda, the same set of questions, the same criteria for uh, dealing with the two cases as any honest outside observer would do. If you think America's involvement in the war in Southeast Asia is over, think again. The Khmer Rouge are the most genocidal people on the face of the earth. Peter Jennings reporting from the killing fields, Thursday. I mean, the great act of genocide in the modern period is Pol Pot, 1975 to, through 1978. That atrocity, I think it would be hard to find any example of a comparable outrage and outpouring of fury and so on and so forth. So that's one atrocity. Well, it just happens that in that case, history did set up a controlled experiment. Have you ever heard of a place called East Timor? I uh, can't say that I have. Where? <laughs> East Timor? Nope. Noah. Well, it happens that right at that time there's another atrocity, very similar in character, but differing in one respect. We were responsible for it, not Pol Pot. Ford and Kissinger visited Jakarta, I think it was December 5th. We know that they had requested that Indonesia delay the invasion until after they left because it would be too embarrassing. And within hours, I think, after they left, the invasion took place on December 7th. What happened on December 7th in 1975 is just one of the great, um, great evil deeds of history. Early in the morning, bombs began dropping on Dili. The number of troops that invaded Dili that day almost outnumbered the entire population of the town. And for two or three weeks, there was just, they just killed people. This council must consider Indonesian aggression against Timor as the main issue of the discussion. When the Indonesians invaded, the UN reacted as it always does, calling for um, sanctions and condemnation and so on. Various watered-down resolutions were passed, but the U.S. was very clearly not going to allow anything to work. So the Timorese were fleeing into the jungles by the thousands. By late 1977-78, Indonesia set up receiving centers for those Timorese who came out of the jungle waving white flags. Those the Indonesians thought were more educated or who were suspected of belonging to Fredlin or other opposition parties were immediately killed. They took women aside and flew them off to Delhi in helicopters for use by the Indonesian soldiers. They killed children and babies. But in those days, their main strategy and their main weapon was starvation. By 1978, it was approaching really genocidal levels. The church and other sources estimated about 200,000 people killed. Uh, the U.S. backed it all the way. The U.S. provided 90% of the arms. Uh, right after the invasion, arms shipments were stepped up. When the uh, Indonesians actually began to run out of arms in 1978, the Carter administration moved in and increased arms sales. And other Western countries did the same, Canada, England, Holland, and everybody who could make a buck was in there trying to make sure they could kill more Timorese. There is no Western concern for issues of aggression, atrocities, human rights abuses, and so on, if there's a profit to be made from them. Uh, nothing could show more, it more clearly than this case. It wasn't that nobody had ever heard of East Timor. 